Recorded on November 18th, 1993, Nirvana's MTV Unplugged in New York was never meant to be a big deal, but it turned out to be the band's final album. In the weeks leading up to the show, the group was breaking up, producers were freaking out, and Kurt Cobain was struggling to stay clean. But Nirvana still wanted to give their fans something special. So, today we're going to take a look at behind the scenes of Nirvana's MTV Unplugged performance. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other historic concerts you would like to hear about. Okay, time to get doused in mud and soaked in bleach. Nirvana Unplugged is now considered a classic performance, so it's hard to believe there was a time when anyone doubted it. But the show was far from a sure thing. According to Kurt Cobain biographer Charles R. Cross, prior to recording Unplugged, the band was falling apart. Not only were the pressures of fame weighing on them, but Cobain was renegotiating the group's publishing so he could get a bigger cut of the royalties. Cross claims that after telling the band he wanted a bigger cut of new and previous songs, Nirvana more or less broke up. In a 2015 interview with KNKX, Cross further claimed that Cobain was very sick prior to the show and was struggling that day with withdrawals. According to Cross, Cobain was reportedly throwing up backstage and had to lie down on a sofa. Cross also alleged that someone from MTV bought Cobain benzodiazepines to help soothe his symptoms, and that MTV on their dime went and bought banned medication from a corrupt pharmacist so Kurt could go on stage and perform. So it was less come as you are and more come in in a condition in which you can actually play. Speaking of playing, Nirvana drummer Dave Grohl once said, it's not important if drums stand out to people, but rather that they sound like a big bomb going off. That's an awesome approach if you're touring with acts like Dinosaur Jr. and the Melvins, but less awesome for playing a low-key acoustic show. In fact, all throughout the rehearsals for Unplugged, no one was really sure if Grohl would be able to temper his performance and play softly. That's like inviting Animal from the Muppets to play in a drum circle. You're just asking for trouble. Producer Alex Coletti worried that Grohl's ferocious technique would make a bad-sounding electric show instead of a good-sounding acoustic show. In the end, Coletti had to gently nudge Grohl toward playing with a pair of swizzle sticks to keep him from drumming too hard. He even gave the sticks to Grohl in Christmas wrapping paper, in an effort to not offend the rock star. In fact, Nirvana drummer Dave Grohl admitted years later that he thought the Unplugged show was going to go down in flames. Grohl said that even though the show had become one of the band's most memorable, it was supposed to be a disaster. Not only was the band underprepared, they were also not used to performing in an acoustic setting. According to the future Foo Fighters frontman, the few rehearsals they did were terrible. Grohl later recalled that though the set never came together, they decided to go on with the show anyway. In his own words, Grohl claimed, Everyone thought it was horrible. Even the people from MTV thought it was horrible. Then we sat down and the camera started rolling and something clicked. You don't really have to be a seasoned balladeer to realize Nirvana Unplugged wasn't exactly unplugged in the strictest sense. Sure, everyone used acoustic guitars, but Kurt Cobain's guitar, a Martin D18E, was outfitted with electric pickups as well as a tone and volume knob. Cobain also ran the guitar through a few different effects pedals, which can most notably be heard on the band's now classic cover of David Bowie's The Man Who Sold the World. The guitar was also connected to an amp, possibly a 1960s Fender Twin Reverb or a Bassman, that the production team actually hid on stage. We count at least three plugs. Shameless false advertising, MTV. Producer Alex Coletti later recalled this created a bit of a nightmare for the network. At the time, MTV really believed that it was the acoustic aspect of the show, as opposed to the big name acts, that was driving viewership. But Cobain insisted on having his amp on stage, and MTV relented. The production staff built a case for the amp that made it look like a monitor, and it's admittedly hard to spot even if you know it's there. The sets for Unplugged were generally meant to reflect the stripped-down nature of the musical arrangements. Pearl Jam performed in front of velvet curtains, and Alice in Chains illuminated their stage with purple lights, but that's not what Nirvana wanted. Cobain wanted to make sure his set had a unique vibe, and when speaking with producers for the show, he insisted that the stage be covered in flowers and candles. Producer Alex Coletti later explained, I said, like a funeral? And he said, yeah, like a funeral. Cobain specifically asked for stargazer lilies, which created some problems for production designer Tom McPhillips, who found them particularly hard to track down at that time of year. McPhillips solved the problem by buying fake stargazer lilies, made from fabric by a company in Pennsylvania. They put the real flowers in the foreground and the fake ones in the background. That's right, 
Hide your shame, fake lilies. One aspect of Nirvana Unplugged that fans have always puzzled over is the question of why Kurt Cobain sat in an office chair when everyone else was seated on stools. According to Coletti, Kurt simply wasn't comfortable on the stool, so he walked into the control room and wheeled out one of their chairs. The producers didn't think the office chair looked good. It didn't even match Cobain's self-designed funeral theme, but they wanted to keep him happy, so they agreed to it. Because it was a very unusual show for Nirvana, Cobain was incredibly anxious about performing. It also didn't help that his struggles with addiction and the uncertainty over Nirvana's future were weighing down on him. Not exactly the best time to challenge yourself with a televised acoustic performance. While the audience was filled with both fans and celebrities, including Kate Moss according to some accounts, Cobain made sure his personal friends were sitting in the front row. Amy Finnerty, the former VP of talent at MTV, told The Ringer that during rehearsals, Cobain asked if she could sit up front with all of their friends so he could look at them to calm his nervousness. Speaking of Cobain's friends, an interesting piece of Nirvana lore is the odd couple friendship between Kurt Cobain and comedian Bobcat Goldthwait. Now that you mention it, Cobain's singing voice does sound like a Bobcat impression. The two were so close that Bobcat was backstage at the show to hang out with Cobain and help him deal with the pressure of the performance. Peter Barron of Geffen Records recalls walking into the green room and seeing Kurt sitting there with a comedian. Bobcat later said, I definitely did feel often that it would just be him and I kind of a little bit of padding between him and the world. Sometimes the chaotic warbling of the guy who tried to shoot Bill Murray in Scrooged is the most soothing sound you can hear. Cobain personally asked Kurt Kirkwood of the band The Meat Puppets, who were touring with Nirvana at the time, if Kirkwood and his brother Chris would sit in and play guitar on three Meat Puppet songs Cobain wanted to cover during the unplugged performance. According to Kirkwood, I was just part of the audience up until our part. By the time we got on, it was a really good show. But when Cobain let it slip that he was going to have musical guests, MTV executives thought Nirvana was planning to bring some Seattle rock royalty to the show. According to director Beth McCarthy Miller, MTV thought a tour bus was going to roll in from Seattle and drop off Chris Cornell of Soundgarden and the guys from Alice in Chains. And everyone assumed Eddie Vedder himself was going to show up for a duet. Biographer Cross expounded on the miscommunication, saying, MTV literally thought that Kurt would bring Eddie Vedder, Chris Cornell, and Lane Staley. And what Kurt did instead was brought his two friends. Sometimes you really can't find a better man. To mainstream music fans, Nirvana was practically inseparable from the many hits of their breakthrough album, Nevermind, especially the song, Smells Like Teen Spirit. But aside from Come As You Are, none of the group's hit singles were in the set list. Instead, Nirvana crafted a set with an elegant flow. Musically, the band took chances, adding a cellist, changing the arrangement of Penny Royal T, and performing six cover songs, five of which were essentially unknown to broader audiences. That's pretty risky. Imagine going to Ray Stevens, play an acoustic set, and leaving without hearing one note of Guitarzan. There would be riots. Throughout the set, Cobain made sure to stay away from anything that made the performance sound too polished. This is especially noticeable on songs like Where Did You Sleep Last Night and All Apologies. The raw, tortured sound of All Apologies comes from Cobain struggling to hit many of the notes in the song. Initially, producers asked if the band wanted to change the song's key, or if Cobain wanted to use a capo, a tool that raises the pitch of a guitar. But Cobain said he'd prefer to strain his voice to reach the note. Miraculously, the show came together perfectly. Nirvana played 14 songs in total, but producers wanted a little more. After Cobain's heartbreaking rendition of Where Did You Sleep Last Night, he walked off stage and was met with requests for an encore. Coletti says he threw out suggestions of random b-sides like Marigold and Verse Chorus Verse, but Cobain simply answered, I don't think we can top that last song. That might be the gentlest way anyone has ever been told to f off. After the filming concluded, Cobain went to the control room to watch the performance. Some of the producers found this nerve-wracking, but by all accounts, he was pleased with the show. The only request Cobain made was to keep one specific shot. According to director Beth McCarthy Miller, Cobain said, there's a song that at the end I smile, and my manager told me to smile more, so can you please put that shot in the show? The producers thought Cobain was kidding, but they made sure to keep his smile in the final edit. Following a long court battle over its ownership, 
The 1959 Martin D-18E guitar Kurt Cobain used during the Unplugged performance recently went up for sale at Julian's Auctions. In June of 2020, it was sold to Peter Friedman, a businessman from Australia, for just over $6 million. According to Entertainment Weekly, the sale set four specific records, most expensive guitar, most expensive memorabilia, world's most expensive acoustic guitar, and world's most expensive Nirvana memorabilia sold at auction. Cobain originally bought the instrument for $5,000. Not a bad markup. Wonder how much that office chair went for. So what do you think? What's your favorite MTV Unplugged performance? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.